Hi, my name is Tyler St. Gillet. I handle the wristwatches and jewelry here at Jones & Horan. Hi, I'm Fred Hansen. I'm the Pocket Watch Specialist here at Jones & Horan. Today, we're going to be going over the early history of the Rolex watch company up until about World War II. And a lot of this information you might already know, but there might be some little bits here that you haven't heard before or, you know, might shock you. This story takes us back to its beginnings in London in about 1905, when Hans Walsdorf and Alfred Davis started a business. That business in the beginning, it was importing Swiss-made movements, casing them in English cases, and distributing them to retailers. Kind of a humble beginning, but... I would say very humble. Yeah. You know, no, no more so than just a, a modern jeweler slapping his name on a, a private label. Pretty much. But uh, Hans Wallstorff was a little more ambitious than that, and he really had a, a lot of vision for where he wanted to go, and that was quality watches that fit every aspect of life. And in 1908, he came up with a name, Rolex, and he wanted something simple, easy to say in any language, and that fit nicely on the dial of a watch. He also thought it sounded like the winding of a watch. Not so sure about that last part, but... I, I could see it. I could see it. Yeah, I'm going to let it go because I think it worked out pretty good for him. I, I, yeah, I yeah. think I think it was a, a, a strong choice. In 1915, so seven years later, that became the official name mm -hmm. of the company. In the time in between, though, two more things that stood out. 1910, Rolex received the world's first chronometer rating for a wristwatch. Unheard of at the time, well, obviously, first. Indeed. And 1914, they received a QA rating for a wristwatch. Uh, for those uh, not aware of what a QA is, a modern uh, COSC in Switzerland, which issues chronometer certificates, so you see officially certified chronometer on the dial. The Q Observatory in England was uh, the, the predecessor when England ruled everything. Yeah. So Rolex was really pushing the boundaries forward of what a wristwatch could do performance-wise. But World War I kind of showed something about the watches of the time, didn't it, Tyler? It certainly did. It showed the woeful inadequacies of not only wristwatches, but all, all timekeeping devices in the trenches with the mud and the water and the shelling. There was room for improvement. Quite a bit. If wristwatches were truly going to surpass pocket watches, wristwatches were the the, the up-and-comers of the time, and you know there weren't as many people on board with it as one might imagine. It wasn't uh, such a cut and dry step that that so many people thought, oh, this is definitely the next step in evolution for the the modern watch. I think I think there is some resistance to it on a style basis. That too. But then I think people realize the practicality of not having to dig in your pocket at all times. That's true. And, and so much of it, too, has to do with, you know, early wristwatches, especially when you get to the first wristwatches. They were made for women. And turn of the century, that's a different time. And mm -hmm. a lot of people were viewing those as, as, as slightly feminine, wearing your watch on your wrist like a bracelet, that... There was there was there was pretty strong pushback, but the, the first world war really really proved to people that nothing beats having a, a solid reliable watch on your wrist that you can just glance at without having to fumble into your pocket. For. So what were what were Rolex's first steps towards water resistance following that war? So after the war, there was a Swiss case maker named Borgel who came out with a design uh, for a hermetically sealed case. They had a an inner case with a winding crown, case back, everything you would expect from a, a wristwatch, which was inset into a, a larger trench watch style case with a screwed bezel. So it was all contained within the inner case. There's no visible holes, there's no visible crown. You've got your, your soldered on wire lugs, but that's about it. So it's an improvement, but it's kind of like sticking your watch inside a tube. You can't really access it. It's not it, quite the practicality. Exactly, right? and keep in mind all watches, pocket, and wrist, minus some dalliance from Breguet in the 18th century, were manual work. So you had to open that up and wind it every single right. day. Hans Wildorf, he knew this, and he knew that his company could do better. And he became fascinated with the idea of making a truly element-resistant wristwatch. Well, that, that came in 1926, didn't it, with Royster? It did. It came yes. with the invention of 
the Rolex Oyster. And what, what makes an Oyster an Oyster? Well, uh, the Oyster has, very similar actually to the, the, the screw-down bezel of that watch, but the crown now is a, a threaded crown with a tube that's actually threaded into the case so that the crown can screw down into the case to create a tight seal. The bezel also in these early Oyster cases screwed into a piece in the center so that the case back was screwing in and the bezel was screwing in to create a three-part seal. So a little known fact here is that the Oyster in 1926 wasn't just a wristwatch. There were Oyster pack watches too. Not many, very few. The market was moving away from the pack watches to the wrist watches, but we do happen to have one of those in our upcoming sale. Now, it looks like a fairly normal 1920s Art Deco era pocket watch. Right. It doesn't look like anything out of the ordinary, although you do see these neurals on the case back and the bezel, and then you see the wonderful little Rolex Oyster above the subsidiary seconds, and you know this is something quite special. Right. Although a lovely idea, not the most useful of watches there weren't really many people taking their solid gold pocket watches out for a swim for a swim yeah. or you know was it wasn't to be the the success that Hans Wildorf had hoped however the wristwatches absolutely were if you needed a watch to go anywhere and do anything by then it was really there was really only one game in town well, I think they really showed that in 1927 didn't they with Mercedes Gleitz swimming across the English Channel with the Rolex Oyster wristwatch. And Hans Wildorf, the marketing genius he was, took out the entire front page of the Daily Mail and made this wonderful ad showing Mercedes Gleitz swimming across the channel, proudly wearing her Rolex Oyster wristwatch and showing that we had really come into a new age. A watch could be put on your wrist and you could go anywhere and do anything with it, not having to fear about hurting the very, very delicate mechanism inside by a little bit of dust or a little bit of moisture. You could be as rough and tumble as any adventurer was. That really kind of became the theme of Rolex advertising for the next 90-some years, hasn't it? Still it? is. It's, you can do anything. You can do it with your Rolex, and it can stand up to whatever you need. It's true. Hans Wolsdorf achieved his goal of water resistance and waterproofing, but there was still one step he really had in his sight. We said a watch still had to be wound manually until 1931 with the Rolex Perpetual, right? Absolutely. And, and this was quite a game changer. There was another company at the time named Harwood who also had been experimenting with automatic wristwatches. However, it used a bumper, so there's two springs with a rotor bouncing back and forth, which isn't the best design mm -hmm. on the planet. But it never caught on. Harwood eventually died, and the Rolex Oyster Perpetual remained king. And that's because their rotor was the first one to have 360 degrees of motion. So it was quiet, absurdly efficient for the era, and it really put Rolex, who was already leaps and bounds ahead of the competition in terms of waterproofing their watches to the elements. But now, did you really need any other watch? It was the one watch you might need for the rest of your life. And with Rolex's Oyster crown system, this is also alleviating a lot of the issues with unscrewing the crown, screwing it back in every single day. That Oyster Pocket Watch we looked at a few minutes ago, and that's a familiar case design. Where did that go in the wristwatch world? In 1935, the Italian Navy contracted the Italian firm Panerai to create a watch for their diving teams. Fairly new idea at the time. There was, there was diving equipment before then. I mean, there was even a, a submarine in the Civil War, uh, which actually, I think, sunk a ship. Quite impressive at the time. But diving with, with submarines and all of the modern technology from the First World War, navies wanted to be at the cutting edge, and they wanted a good dive watch that could go under the water and assist their divers. Panerai talked with Rolex and were able to design arguably the first dive watch, the Panerai Luminor. Following Panerai, we have the lead up to World War II. And World War II is where we'll be beginning our next segment. From that point forward and into the launch of the Smart Model Rolexes. Thank you so much for spending time with us. All of the watches we talked about today are going to be sold in the April 25th live auction event. Sold unreserved and with no buyer's premium. Now the link to the auction is in the description. You can look at our entire live catalog and bid with us on the day if you'd like. We hope you join us there for that, and we hope to see these watches go to some of you viewers. And don't forget to like and subscribe.